All right, everyone, we have a packed program. So I'm going to just go ahead and jump in. It's so nice to see everyone here for our event this evening, seeing this story, a conversation on contemporary illustration. Tonight's program is co-hosted by PAFA and by the Woodmere Museum. I'm Abby King, the Assistant Director of Adult Programs here at PAFA. And I want to, of course, um, their screen is off, but I have to thank my co-host and Woodmere counterpart, Curator of Education, Hildy Tao. So to start, I wanted to respectfully acknowledge that I, along with many of our speakers and attendees and PAFA, are speaking to you from the ancestral lands of the Lene Lenape people, whose presence and resilience in Pennsylvania continues to this day. I wanna take this opportunity to honor the original caretakers of this land and recognize the histories that have brought our institutions and ourselves here. Before I hand it over to a special guest tonight, I did want to mention we are recording tonight's event and we will be sharing it later on PAFA's YouTube channel and I believe on the Woodmere site as well. So if you know of anyone who missed tonight's conversation, I'm going to be sharing a link to where that will live momentarily. Um, for our structure tonight, our artists are going to be sharing their screen, introducing themselves and their work, and then speaking on a few topics related to the field of illustration. We will also have time at the end for questions. So feel free as we go to drop questions in the chat, um, but know that we will address those at the end of the program. Tonight, we are here to celebrate the Woodmere Annual 79th Juried Exhibition, which features many PAFA alum and faculty. And tonight we have a special guest to speak more about the show and introduce our artists. So Bill Osman, Director of Woodmere, I'm gonna hand things over to you. Um, you're muted, Bill. Just want to make sure. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Well, Abby, thank you so much. Um, I'm Bill Valerio. I want to thank everybody for joining us and say it's wonderful to be working together with Papa on the program tonight. And it's been wonderful to work with David Wiesner. <laughs> David is you know, one of the great artists of Philadelphia in my book. Uh, the chair of the illustration department at PAFA and the juror of Woodmere's 79th annual show. Woodmere's annual um, has been a, an event that we look forward to every year at Woodmere now for 79 years. And it represents, you know, one of the ways that we roll up our sleeves and engage with the art that's happening on the ground and bubbling up to the top here in, in Philadelphia. We have, we invite a different juror every year and we want the juror to be an anchor who, you know, has his or her own interests that shapes the presentation of the art that's happening in Philadelphia today and serves as a magnet. And so we know that, you know, if, if David is, um, you know, the juror of the annual show, and David is, you know, one of the most distinguished illustration artists of, you know, the world today, and I, I don't think that's an exaggeration, um, that the, the, the artists who apply to be in the jury show um, and, you know, ask to be sorted and selected to have their works on view in the annual show, um, you know, those artists are, um, are, are there and are participating, you know, because of David and because they know who David is and what his interests are. And this year is a particularly a sort of interesting show that explores the many sides of illustration. And it was, you know, really wonderful to see that PAFA has such terrific representation in the show, both on the faculty and on the staff level. So I couldn't be happier and I'm glad we're taking this time together to unwind this and, and talk it through a little bit. So um, we are going to hear from four artists and I'm just going to um, sort of introduce each of them now and then each of them will speak in turn and maybe I'll ask each of you to introduce you know, the next artist after you finish speaking. Um, we are first going to hear from David Wiesner, as I've said, the juror of the annual exhibition. Um, we will then hear from Jessica Abel, and Jessica is a distinguished faculty member at 
um, at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts as well. And then um, we'll hear from Chen Lin Tsai, um, an artist um, who's a PAFA alum, as well as Kate Samworth, also a distinguished artist and PAFA alum. So that's the order of presentation. We will have question and answers um, after each artist presents about five minutes or so about you know, what, what it is that drives their work. And we'll be talking about what illustration is. And you know, we look forward to a lively evening. With that, I'd like to turn it over to David. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, and thanks for covering the background of the uh, exhibition. I have to say, I am not the chair of the illustration department at PASH. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Jessica is uh, adjunct faculty. Um, but thanks for the promotion. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was great to get the call from uh, Bill and the museum to ask me to be the juror. Um, I thought they were asking me to be a juror, but then I found out I was the juror. And it was a little intimidating at first, but it turned out to be a really great experience. Um, really interesting work came in. Uh, the call was based around narrative art, um, seeing the story. You know, in a sense, all art is narrative, but it was great to um, get people who probably wouldn't have known about uh, the annual exhibit to um, send work in and, and put it in for consideration. So we cover from fine art, sculpture, painting, um, we have comics represented, we have um, picture books, really a whole range of different kinds of art forms that are dealing with telling stories. And um, it, was, it was great. And a big shout out to um, the members of the museum, um, Rick and uh, Rachel, who basically organized the hanging of the show and did such a great job to really orient everything in relation to each other. So um, I can't show everything, sadly, but um, I do want to um, just show a few examples of things that um, use, and, I, and I'm, I know I'm showing some things that may show up, but basically, you know, oops, I wanted to start with this one. Um, one of the things certainly that I respond to is um, images multiple images working together, um, images in sequence, and they can come from different places. So Dana Higgins, who's a, you know, a painter, an oil painter, um, submitted these, these wonderful um, paintings of the same um, location, but from two different vantage points, night and day. Um, this sort of uh, look at the same thing from different, um, different views is, is certainly a cornerstone of my art school upbringing and, and the way I approach things. Um, again, keeping with sequences, what Chen Lin did with the, his piece on the masks and Christopher Houston, Houston um, again, abstract, torn paper, very minimalist line form. Um, also, you know, sequence, the, the grouping of these together to create something more than the, the single image in and of itself. Um, sequence, of course, plays a huge part in comics as Jessica and Matt Madden um, approach. And Mark Rice, an artist who, these uh, unbelievable line of cuts, um, there's three of them in the show, huge. And while it's a, this is a single image, it's almost made up of a hundred different stories in all of these different sections. There is just a massive amount of story going on here that's, that's quite incredible to see. Um, Kate Samworth also working as are others with single images that are packed with narrative material. Uh, Matt Brogan, I'm sorry, his name was Morgan, um, and uh, Alexandra Ting, uh, again, combining so much into one image, um, letting you really attempt to for everybody to decipher what is going on um, in uh, the same with Jeff Brown and uh, Megan Cox. So if you haven't seen the show, I hope you know something like this will, will whet your appetite because 
there's really just a tremendous amount of uh, wonderful stuff. And um, I am also represented, uh, if you don't know my work, mainly I make picture books. I've been doing that basically all of my career. Um, and most of my books have no words. Um, wordless storytelling is the focus of a lot of what I do. Not all of them. Ultimately, the story dictates whether the, what I do needs words or not. Um, but um, it is sort of the, uh, the cornerstone of my, my practice. Um, what I have in the show is, in fact, um, a time-based piece, which was work that I did for an app. So by pinching and zooming, like when you make text bigger, you can go deeper and deeper into the spot on the back of the bus, which will allow you to enter a half a dozen different worlds. Um, it was my way of trying to uh, tell stories on a digital device, on a tablet, in a way that didn't involve gaming, it didn't involve um, activities. It was focused solely around images um, and story behind them. Um, the nice thing about this was that I was able to create the art in the way that I do the art for my books with um, watercolor, um, pen and ink. Um, many of the images were single full um, pictures, but much of it was done by compositing bits and pieces of small uh, images together, um, digitally cut out. So uh, there was a massive amount of work, but uh, fascinating combination. These are some screenshots of some of the images in it. So again, you know, as another alternative to say something more traditional to a book, um, what can we do with the digital realm to continue to tell stories, um, that was part of what I was looking at. So that's a little bit about me and uh, the show. And I believe now I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica. We'll be talking next. Hi everybody, I'm Jessica Abel. I am a cartoonist and the chair of the Poffitt Illustration Department. <laughs> um, not clear, am I supposed to be sharing this? Cause I don't think I have the most up-to-date slides in my deck. I'm, sh I'm sharing, I'm pulling it up now, Jessica. Okay, just checking. Okay. Um, so I have three pieces in the show, which are um, original drawings that are become comics pages. Um, comics is uh, an art form that of course is all about story, but also it, it it's, it overlaps with illustration as we think of it, but is not, it's not a one-to-one, -one. the same way that um, David illustrates his books, but he also writes his books. There's like, you know, you're writing with pictures and drawing with words and so on. So um, what I put here in the slides is um, images of the black and white pages that are on the wall in the museum. They come from this book, Trish Trash, Roller Girl of Mars, um, which is my most recent book. And um, they're actually, these are actually not even photos of the pages on the wall. They are scans that are cleaned up. And if you, you see, if you go to the museum and you see the original piece, you'll see there's like blue line stuff printed and there's like marks and erases and like racing and like, you know, white corrections and stuff because essentially it's a manuscript page that we're looking at here. Um, so what I did is I then placed the final page as it was printed next to it. So you can see the difference. And this process uh, for me was a very, we're skipping around a lot here, I think, because the, it's loading slowly. Just hang out, it'll be fine. <laughs> um, and the, so this is a very collaborative process where I went back and forth with an assistant who was drawing backgrounds for me um, it, digitally to create pencils. And then she, uh, inked the backgrounds and then sent physically sent the pages to me and I inked the foregrounds and then I scanned them and then another person colored them and another person lettered them. So you end up with this um, piece, the color piece that is, you know, the product of the work of, visually the product of the work of, of many people. Um, I think there's one more after this. We missed the first one, but that's okay. There we go. There are two more, there are two more. Oh, okay. 
So um, the first one is a scene, this takes place on Mars, obviously, because, you know, Roller Girl of Mars takes place on Mars. And this is a scene where there's been a, um, a large explosion or collapse inside a, an industrial space that's being excavated um, under Mars. And our, our heroines are um, all on roller skates. So skating down the ramp there. Floating the next, there we go. There we go. And then this is a nighttime scene. And so one of the things I was able to do because we're using digital means to do coloring was to do these cool sort of like transparencies and glows and like sort of tech stuff. And you'll notice like, for example, um, the second panel there, there's a guy kind of holding his hands up like this, <laughs> the original drawing. And then we put in layers or do additional bits of drawing um, on other layers to create that. Um, he's, he's using a digital interface that's sort of holographic in, in midair. So that was fun stuff to be able to add in after the fact. Um, the other things that I have here in the slides are just covers of some other books of mine that are done in a far more traditional means for the most part. This, this book, La Perdita, is a, a, a book that's entirely hand-drawn, hand-lettered, um, that I was published in 2006. And it's uh, also not science fiction and not for teenagers like Trish Trash is. I mean, Trish Trash is for adults, but you know, from like sort of 14 on up. And La Perdita is really much more of a an adult book and kind of where I come from in comics, which is long form stories aimed at grownups. Um, so it's a story of Carla, who's a young woman um, of uh, Mexican American parentage, but who was raised by her Anglo parents. So doesn't really know her Mexican heritage. And she kind of decides she needs to find her roots and heads off to Mexico city on a whim, not knowing anything about it. And her ignorance causes a lot of chaos. So. <laughs> Not exactly a rip roar and tail. <laughs> so the next slide is I'm trying. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's me. coming. It'll come. The next slide is out on the wire, I believe, um, which is a nonfiction book about the art of storytelling, um, where I interviewed something around I don't know thirty-five or so of the best podcast and radio producers um, in America. So people like Ira Glass and Jad Avramrod and um, you know, all the people from Planet Money and The Moth and, and um, tried to think about what were the commonalities in their storytelling techniques? What could we learn from them? And so it's a book about storytelling concepts from the, starting from audio, but really a for application across the board. And again, done in comics. And so there's a lot of um, essayistic pieces and sort of, um, so there's parts which are like interviews essentially where I'm talking to an individual person or they're talking to each other and it's just, you know, straight up comics page where people are, you know, having a conversation. And there's other parts that are more abstracted where there's um, a concept to be explained and I'm, I'm using charts and metaphorical, not charts really, but metaphorical image pieces in order to tell that story. So it's um, hard to get into without showing lots of pages, but um, that's it, it in itself, as I'm exploring storytelling, story, the sort of high level storytelling concepts, I had to figure out visual representations for those concepts. And so that was a really interesting project to do. And this, this book came out in, I think 2015, I wanna say, um, this is sort of second to last of my comics. Uh, right before Trish Trash came out. And then the last slide I have is of my book, Growing Gills, which is a non-comics book. Um, and I really have been moving more into doing writing, um, prose writing, and not really working on comics or illustration right now, although I'm teaching it. I, you know, I'm still at PAFA and, and interested in thinking about illustration a ton. But this book is a book about, um, well, it's a book aimed at serious creatives who are stuck and trying to figure out why they're not getting their work done and how to do better, how to do more better. <laughs> and that's what I've been focusing on for the last few years. And I think that's the last slide. Yep. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Chen Lin Tsai. Nice to meet you here. And I'm honored to be invited by PAFA and Wimia Museum to share with you some of my understanding and thinking about the illustration. 
I started uh, a PAVA's MFA program from 2015 to 17. PAVA has the best uh, professors and artist friends. During this period, I broadened my artistic vision and clarified my future career uh, direction. The, the work, the identity, uh, identity and mask, this piece yeah, on the screen, this piece exactly you know, create you know, while I was studying at PAFA. So about this work, I have to mention my background. I come from China and I have studied and lived in the capital Beijing for 11 years. I got my first MFA degree in Beijing and also I uh, I worked for you know, more than 10 mural projects in different cities you know, in China. So while you know, I get, I have, I take this kind of you know, achievements, but as a young man, I also feel uh, pressure from the society or from the different aspects. So at that time, I was a bit you know, hesitate about where my art career would, be, would go. So in 2014, I plan to come to the United States to continue my study. So I'm looking for the, the to the United States as the, this is a, the World Art Center. At least for me, I understand from this that before I came to here, you know, in China we have a lot of imagination or thinking, you know, about the United States. So that's the reason why I come here and then study here, and then I'm thinking that my decision is right. So here, it's, there should be you know, a lot of you know, deep, you know so many good artist for me to study. So before I came, I came to United States, China experienced many years of the environment pollution problem, especially the air pollution. So in those years, Beijing made the headlines in the newspaper every you know, year because of the air pollution. It's against this background that I studied my creation as Chinese, we are not a uh, you know, stranger of, we are, we are very familiar to the facial masks. You know, so in the collective memory of Chinese people, wearing facial masks in most cases is to prevent you know, air pollution happen frequently, but this is due to the envir uh, environmental you know, cost brought by the rapid development of the Chinese economy. But, when the air pollution is very serious and frequently happen, facial masks become a daily necessity that everyone needs to you know, needs the every moment. Uh, I imagine that we wear facial masks for a long time so frequently and the facial mask has become part of our body and then our skin. So when we take off the facial masks, our skin, our blood vessels, our muscle tissues will stick to it. So turning to the sheet of the human skin masks. So therefore I used you know, my painting to record this kind of imagination and illusions. So can we go to the next piece, uh, next uh, slide. So the details, so on top of the painting, you can see there's a lot of you know, kind of textures and this texture is not usual texture, it's kind of a blow from the human skin. So I want to use this to show my concern about the relationship between human and environment. And of course, you now we the people wearing facial masks uh, in the on the old times for uh, prevent air pollution, but now you know since the Hong Kong event on even just now, because when I first show my 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 friend, so people. No, we know people wear uh, facial masks also for protest. And then when I show my work and all the friends, all the people I talk to now also in China, when the air pollution is serious, everyone has to wear facial masks from day to night. And even they wear facial masks at home. People cannot believe it, people cannot imagine it. And who knows, you know, so and now you know, we have been, you know, go through one, one, and a half, one and a half year, everyone will have to wear facial masks. So that's already you know, kind of impressed me because you know this is not the China's problem. It's not, not also not only just for the virus, so the a, a national problem. So we have to work together to fight with the you know any kind of issues together. Okay, next one, please. 
So I make my work. Yeah, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Yeah, next slide, uh, I can show you the yeah, text. Chen Lin, it's, something's happening and it's not working. Just give oh, me Okay, no worry. Because I just want to show. Yeah, no, I understand. Uh, audience, mm -hmm. no worry. So I, 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 don't, uh, I don't make there my we go. work. Okay, yeah, I, so here you can see this work is, it looks like, you know, just print, but it's oil, it's oil made on, you know, transparent plexiglass. So the reason why I like uh, trans the plexiglass or the transparent material, because this kind of material bring the, uh, uh, the feeling sort of, you know, shows that these things, you know, it's very fragile and beautiful. So I like this way. So I continue to, you know, explore this kind of technique to painting on the uh, smooth, transparent uh, surface. Then, can we go to the next one? So I find my, you know, I found my direction. So I, I, I found I can create a cellular structure on top the, 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 the transparent surface and use this uh, texture to mimic the cellular structure. I just like under microscope. So I continue to make it, explore it, make it no. So try to use this kind of patterns you know, to give them uh, some kind of narrative content. So I can, so can we go to the next one? So this is one piece of the, my work. So next one. So I just, I don't uh, limit to just the 2D surface. I start to explore my work in 3D you know, ways. So this is a multiple piece paint on top and then just create a 3D painting in space. So when you change your eye, uh, eye, uh, eye level, you will see the image from appear to disappear. So this is an exact perfect match you know, Chinese philosophy, nothing and everything that goes together, just like in Yang or Tai Chi, you know. So, okay, can we go to the next one? Thank you. So I continue to explore it and no limit to just you know, like that one. Cause that the one I just showed is the, the, the image is inspired from the mushroom cloud explosion. So I try to bring the different kind of contents of different kind of symbols together and then try to make them dialogue with each other. I think this is why I understand as an illustration because my, my major is not illustration, but I believe something I create they definitely share the similarity with the illustration art, even though I, I, my material is more you know, different or just more widely, because I, I, I not just making oil painting, I, I'm, I'm also making uh, murals and any others, but I'm sure this is, I can say this is also a kind of you know, illustration. Okay, so can we go to next one? Thank you. Yeah, so here I can introduce some of my public uh, our project, so uh, as I'm, I'm Chinese, so I am uh, came here, so people know me, so people just give me the chance to design the, the big murals for you know, Philadelphia Chinatown. And then I use this one, uh, make this plaza, use the mural to dec uh, decorate. And this plaza is in the center of the Chinatown, and we have the South Chinatown and North Chinatown. The Vine Street Highway, kind of, it's just kind of a, a, a barrier block the south and north part of Chinatown in two parts. So we want people to more explore north part of Chinatown because that's not a developed. So this mural, the purpose of this mural is to kind of create a bridge to connect these two parts of Chinatown community. And then here on top, you can see the koi fish and daily pound. Yeah, as Chinese people or the, not just Chinese culture, uh, also like Japanese culture or the model, we can say broadly, you know, East Asian culture, we believe koi fish can bring, uh, is, uh, is a symbol of a good fortune. So I just use this kind of, you know, cultural things to make it and then make it a koi fish swing and then circle and then connect from south to north. Uh, can we go to the next one? Thank you. Okay, so this is another mural project I created for Cor uh, Korean Culture Center in uh, of the, the South Korea the Embassy in Beijing. So at that, the, at that time, okay, it's almost, no, uh, okay. So, oh yeah, now it's not uh, Tokyo Olympics, okay. So 13 years ago, I created this. I also kind of thinking, you know, China and South Korea, we can use the Olympic as a, uh, uh, no, as a connection to find these two country together. Can we go to the next one? Thank you. 
Oh, this is my mural studio in China. So we used to create the, the huge murals uh, for city museum in China. And then we yeah, use the mural to scale. So th this mural project this is very big. We spent more than a year to do this. And then these murals uh, we, we made is used to try to borrow the historical story, you know, from the, the city and then try to use the artistic way and the visions to express the history of this city and make people can know it and then just kind of, you know, you know decorate and also decorate the environment. And then also the mirrors, I, as I said, mirrors should, uh, should be uh, a little bit different with the you know, studio work, studio art. When I make my studio art, I can make everything I think I want the viewers to get and I want to express my, uh, my own view. But as a public, uh, work, uh, public art, like a mural, I have to think about the mirror speed, you know, you know, communicate with the artist and uh, audience or the public. Also, as my understand, illustration will play this role as well, because the illustration also have the, the commercial, you know, uh, way on you know, use in a commercial in the region. And then just and they play the same you know, function in here. Can we go to the next one, please? Thank you. And here are some my illustration I made for the rail park in Philadelphia. And we create a youth activity guidebook for kids to play and then kind of just design different games for them. Can we go to the next one? Thank you. Yep, this one also for the Philadelphia uh, rail park project. Next one, please. And then uh, last month, I created a illustration poster. I want to say, yeah, <laughs> the combined illustration and poster for the Philadelphia you know, vaccination campaign. And I used the, I bought the, the four favorite, you know, foot, you know the sport you know, mascot you know, from Philadelphia, and then just use them to show, you know, welcome people to get the vaccine, you know, vaccination. So, so this is what I think uh, as a, I'm an artist, you know, what I can do to use my work to not just express my, my artistic vision, also use my work you know, as a bridge to connect you know, the public and arts and then also make my work have the you know, social function. Thank you very much. Okay, let me, uh, so next one, let uh, Kate introduce her work. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kate Samworth, and I also teach um, illustration through the continuing art, continuing ed department at PAFA. Um, I got my start in New Orleans. I was studying painting down there, and I studied at the New Orleans Academy of Fine Art with a man named Azaklis Ozals, who had graduated from PAFA, and he talked about PAFA constantly. And when I moved to Philly, I started taking printmaking courses in the continuing ed department, and I ended up deciding to go get my bachelor's degree, and I studied printmaking there. Um, and so now I'm teaching in the continuing ed department. I'm really happy to have that um, opportunity that, um, that has allowed me to stay connected to PAFA. So you can see my work is influenced by my um, years of printmaking. I work in Scratchboard right now, which is what this image is. Um, Scratchboard was originally developed to replace um, woodcuts in the print, um, in prints in journals and newspapers. So they would photograph these Scratchboard drawings, which look like woodcuts. Um, and so the technique is very similar to printmaking in that sense. It's a hard surface that's coated in a fine white powdery clay and then coated in black ink and you scratch the ink away with anything at all. So I use the back of an X-Acto knife or a sewing needle taped to a pencil. And the reason I like the scratch board is because you can get this sort of old look of an old natural history print or an old book illustration and the medium also allows these really fine details. And I also really work, like to work with black and then pull the lights out. So I'm constantly thinking about the use of light in my images and the mystery that you can add to an image with light and how you can create a real sense of atmosphere and intimacy through changing the direction of the light and so forth. 
I've been working lately on this series that I think of as a modern fairy tale. So I have this sort of teenage girl who maybe tries some magical spells. Um, she's able to communicate with animals. I see her as this um, young girl who lives um, with nature sort of making use of found materials and is very connected to the land around her. And to me, this story that I'm working on presently, it's more important to see the communication between one person and the natural world than the communication between people. So in this series, it tends to be just a single person. Um, I spent a lot of time hiking in Brazil. I was down there for four months hiking and living in a tent. And I really enjoyed the experience of um, walking for days with a guide and a few other people and not seeing anyone else for three or four days at a time, being in this really beautiful wide open space full of incredible birds and insects. Um, each tree contained a really complete ecosystem of bromeliads and the frogs would live in the water that was uh, collected in the bromeliads. Um, there were all sorts of mosses there were different animals living up in the canopy, canopy and then on the trunk and on the grounds below. So I got a really amazing sense of the wonders of nature by traveling through Brazil. And when I, um, when I left PAF, I won the uh, Von Hess Travel Award. And so I used that money to work on farms in Spain and Turkey for six months. So I also got to see a lot of these intentional communities and these houses that were made out of unusual materials like mud and straw, um, old shipping containers, yurts, um, a lot of really incredible resourceful people that were building with available materials and trying to create a space that left a very low impact on the earth around them. And a lot of times the kitchens were open and so it meant that you had wildlife potentially coming in and out of the kitchen. So you had to really um, be aware of what kinds of things you would want to cook and the access that the animals had. And so it was really interesting to just spend so much time living outdoors and being really feeling like part of, of nature in a way that's hard to maintain in the city. So I like to return to those memories through my art and, um, and so I've really enjoyed working on this series just to sort of reconnect with that time in my life and try to reconnect with nature, which, you know, there's been so many ways to think about the way we come out of this pandemic and move forward. So I've spent the last several months really immersed in this world. And to me, the way I develop stories is just to create images on the same uh, series, on the same idea, you know, maybe I didn't get something quite perfect in this one with the lighting, so I might do this image again, or maybe I'd want to change the position of the foxes. And it allows, it allows me to really just spend time in the universes that I create and kind of see where the story takes me. So I've illustrated four books now, and um, each of them has been a very different experience, but it takes me many months to develop an idea, and that comes from just doing these really detailed drawings that allow me to meditate on, on the world that I'm trying to create. Could you please turn it to the next slide? Um, this was actually the first, one of the first in this series. Um, this witch is living out in a trailer. I imagine that she's maybe outside of an old abandoned fracking town or something, and she's chopping wood and getting by and this bear, um, comes to speak with her and she's not afraid and they sort of speak the same language and have the same needs and so there's some sort of um, communication going on and I really got excited by this idea of this person that could have some sort of understanding with the bear even if they're not speaking a language maybe it's just a smell or something that they both understand. I had spent a couple years living on a farm in Virginia and the farm was backed up to the Shenandoah National Park. So we did have a ton of bears on the property and it was really thrilling and terrifying to see them every day. 
and they ripped down my bird feeder and would get into the recycling bin and were constantly climbing the fruit trees and getting the fruit and stuff. So they were very present and um, it was really thrilling, of course. Um, it was also terrifying to walk through the woods because you never knew when you had come between a mother and her cub. So, um, so I enjoyed including this communication in this new series. And if you will please turn it to the next slide. This is um, inspired by my interest in natural history. I also teach a course on the art of natural history through PAFA. Um, I was writing a book about birds, which is when I met David Wiesner years ago. Uh, my first book is called Aviary Wonders. And in researching that book, I started looking more closely at old natural history illustrations. And when you just stare at all these incredible prints and start to look at the technique of the printmakers and also of the extraordinary range of flowers and shapes of petals, and you find the things they have in common and you see how they're different, it becomes really exciting to think about inventing your own botanicals. So this story is inspired by my interest in natural history by trying to find the wonder in nature, by trying to maintain a sense of wonder when every, every question that we have is at our fingertips, we can just reach for our phone and feel like we have the answers. And so I'm really trying to figure out how to keep finding mystery when it seems like that's harder to come by these days. So this book is the adventure of these two girls that go to a faraway land and discover all the marvels there and then return and I've really um, enjoyed reading a lot about all of the explorers that set out um, on ships and were gone for months collecting specimens and trying to ship them back to usually to Europe, often for purposes of colonization and expansion, but sometimes out of sheer curiosity. Um, so if you would please turn it to the next slide. I don't wanna give away too much, but this will be out next month and it's called Grand Isle. The title comes from a little town in Louisiana. I lived in New Orleans for 12 years and I would occasionally go out to this coastal town called Grand Isle. So it's just named after the town, but not related. And please turn it to the next. Um, and so this is just giving you a sense of the book. Um, these are done in acrylics and acrylic inks. And I think that's it. So I'll turn it over to our next artist. Thank you, Kate. We are actually gonna open things up for a little bit of um, a conversation between all of you. And then this is also just a re reminder to folks, if you wanna put questions in the chat, we do have a little bit of time, um, but I did want, and sorry, I'm trying to find the rest of our panelists to make sure I can spotlight all of you so everyone can see you. Um, you know, I want to, one thing I want to kind of jump into is the idea of what illustration is. I think there's so, you all have beautifully demonstrated the amazing range just in this exhibition. And so um, Jessica had shared this image with us. And I was wondering, Jessica, if you could kind of um, talk about what this, what this is that we're looking at. And maybe we kind of, between all the panelists can discuss how it relates to the discussion today. Well, this was just a, a live exercise I did with my um, first year illustration students, or, I mean, second year um, college students a few years ago where I was just asking them to sort of brainstorm what is illustration? What could you, if you're an illustrator, what could you do with that? And this is by no means comprehensive you know, or even that well-organized, but it was just like all the stuff that people came up with in maybe 20 minutes. I mean, there's so many different ways you can use um, visual like processing skills to create work, usually with clients. I mean, very often illustration is work that is collaborative with an editor, with a commercial client, um, like Chen Lin's talking about doing murals and that's with a community and also with, you know, uh, the organizer of the murals and so on, um, that it is it is not exclusively, but often a collaborative art that has um, 
a role to play in communicating something. And so the way that I approach teaching at PAFA is not technique based at all. Although there are a few techniques I teach, but mostly it's not, we're not even doing technique at all. I'm, I'm giving people a creative brief, a problem to solve, to use their visual imagination and their visual problem solving tools, sometimes including narrative and story, not always, um, in order to, to achieve a goal, to achieve communicating something that something could be purely emotional. It could be an idea. It could be something conceptual, like a, you know, you could use like in, infographics, that kind of thing, or it could be a story and something very concrete with steps and pieces to it. So this is, you know, this was like day one. <laughs> so I hadn't actually taught the students yet. This is, this is what we came up with when we were in conversation about it and just kind of riffing about what, which ways it could go. Jessica, yeah, it's amazing just kind of to see it laid out in this way. And I'm curious for our other panelists, you know, how, maybe not necessarily how you define illustration, but how do you feel you fit in with this and how are you pushing the limitations of the medium or not? And um, yeah, I think we've seen some really interesting examples already in your, your presentations, uh, but if you can elaborate on that. Certainly one of the exciting things, um, you know, for me is that it's, it encompasses, I mean, what I do and what I think a lot of everyone here does, it, you're not just painting or drawing pictures. You're, you're a graphic designer, you're a typographer. Um, it, it, it encompasses all these different disciplines. For me, a book is, the book is the thing that I make. Um, I try to make each of the pictures in it the best I can, but it's one piece of the bigger, um, the bigger thing that I'm making, which is the book, which includes the covers, the jacket, the end papers, uh, the title page, the copyright page. I mean, it's it's problem solving. That's I went to RISD and and that's what the entire four years was about problem solving. And it's I have this thing I want to communicate, and how can I? Almost always, it's how can I do that as visual visually as I can. I mean, I try to find visual solutions for all of the things that I'm grappling with. I'm, one of them is to get rid of the text, but there's still, there's, there's, you know, there's the cover, there's title type, there's, there's the title page. Um, and that's exciting. And I work with an editor. I've worked with a, this a same designer on every book that I've done. I've worked with an editor for much of my career, the head of the production department who, you know, I went on press with my books to see how they're printed and, and learned an amazing amount. So. I love that um, that collaboration that Jessica talked about. That being involved, um, there, there, there's this whole group working towards. You know, in my case, it's an idea that I have, and I mean, what an incredible position to be in to have that that entire team there to draw on their expertise. I mean, I know some of it. But I'm I'm not a master topographer, but um, I love that it. It involves, you know, so much, and ultimately, is put out into the world, you know, for anyone to react with. The thing I've really enjoyed doing in the last several years is collaborating with writers, and so I got to work on a book um, for Lulu Miller that was published last year called "Why Fish Don't Exist." It was a work of nonfiction, and so she was. Um, we were talking a lot, which is unusual when you're illustrating a book um, that someone else has written. It's rare that you get to communicate with the author. The publisher usually tries to keep you apart, but we're friends. And so we were able to talk about ideas and she and I have collaborated on a number of projects together. And um, I've been sending her images and she's been writing things to go with them. And it's been really fun to come up with these stories but I feel like I'm not quite the writer that I wish I were so I'm excited to be able to hand it off to her and I've been collaborating also with a novelist named Rachel Klein um, who writes adult fiction and I send her images and she writes these beautiful vignettes for me so it's been really fun to hand over the pictures and let the writer add to them when usually it's the um, writer handing in their work and then we have to interpret it 
and provide images. So it's been fun to work in reverse. That's great. Chenlin, um, I'm curious how much when you're working on the murals, what is the back and forth between the community and yourself? How many people are actually trying to tell you what they want or you know, what is that like? Yes, because you know, especially for the big uh, public project, we have the community outreach. We just need to collect uh, the ideas, the feedback from the community member, just like the project I'm working on now. Uh, currently, I'm working on, on a very big project for Philadelphia Chinatown. Is the mirrors for the 20 floors high building that have a whole exterior wall. And so we create a mirror for them. So we have to reach out to different community community in Chinatown. And then because Chinatown, not just Chinese immigrants, also have different like uh, you know, people from the Southeast Asian people. So a lot of them, so they share a lot of ideas. It's, you know, as an artist, it's not easy to balance everyone's needs, especially they think about they like something or sometimes, you know, people don't like something. So that's a really challenge for me. But as but for me, I like this way because I, I just I, like what I said, I like the arts play a, a, a social, you know, roles in you know, for the community. I'm not just you know, satisfied you know, to please myself or please the, the small group of people, as please the big group of the community. Even though some of the community members, they probably don't have that much training to understand some of the meanings, but it works if you continue to do it. So that's why I can see that it works me to do the murals. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for sharing that. And I want to take this moment to invite Bill Valerio back with us, because I know Bill had a, a question around the idea of narrative and work. Um, so Bill, I'm going to add you to our, our group and Hildy, maybe ask you to change slides. Thank you. And Bill, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that the second time. Um, well, I, I, I'm finding this conversation really fascinating, and um, I am sort of brought back to a conversation that I had several times with, you know, one of the great illustrators of Philadelphia, Charlie Santori, who passed away recently, and I'm guessing many of you knew Charlie. Um, he became famous for illustrating TV guide covers and, you know, was something of a legend um, in in both the world of illustration and antique collecting and things like that. And, you know, Charlie would often describe to me, you know, difficult um, relationships with editors or publishers and really having to work very hard to maintain the integrity of his vision. And Kate, when you described, you know, in your remarks just a few minutes ago that, you know, a, an editor or a publisher would try to keep you know, the illustrator and the author apart, that seems so counterintuitive to me. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, David, you asked Chen Lin about, you know, sort of the positive dimension of community impact on say a project like a mural, but I'm wondering, you know, if in your practices you feel like, um, you know, as artists who have to collaborate and create products that, you know, have a specific, you know, client that has a market-based goal, do you feel, you know, that you're sometimes put in compromised positions and, and how do you hold your ground if, if that's the case? Yeah, I've heard some of Charlie's stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you'll find people who have really contentious relationships with publishers and um, others who don't. Um, in part, you know, it, it can depend on where you are in your career, how the outcome of it, you know, if you're starting out, um, that can be tough to, to fight for stuff. Uh, I've, I've always had great, you know, relationships, um, but you are, you know, they're entrusting, you know, money to produce something. Um, and uh, you know, I always, I, I've worked with people who trust me as the artist, um, 
I, I value the input of the editor and, um, but it's, uh, you know, it's different for everybody. It's, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I wish I, uh, I don't want to tell stories, other people's stories for them. Um, but some people, you're often dealing with non-visual people who um, will say, you know, the marketing department says this sells based on who knows what. And, you know, what's up, how do you counter something like that? Um, again, it, it, Charlie was a, it certainly over time in a position to basically say, this, it's my way or I'm leaving, um, but not everybody has that, that ability. Um, it takes a lot of, you know, politics. It, it takes, uh, you know, if you get upset and, and storm out, you know, I don't know that that's going to end up getting the work done the way you might want to. It's a hard thing, and it's certainly not something I think that, you know, you learn in school. Uh, I have a couple thoughts, too, that I'd like to offer about that um, communication between the author and illustrator. To me, it does make a lot of sense to not have them communicating, because a lot of times the author comes with ideas for the artist that don't necessarily enhance the book or the idea or the story. It's these personal things maybe that they wanted included, but the job as the illustrator is to communicate something visually to the audience that's not written on the page. And a lot of times the author doesn't have that knowledge that we have. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I think it makes sense to not have the author trying to give too much direction to the artist. Personally, I feel it's more fun to have less direction so that I have more freedom. And when I look at a manuscript, I want to figure out how can I make this interesting for myself and add something to it that's consistent to the story, but that's not just repeating what's written on the page. And um, my other thought is like, I got to work with an editor who absolutely made my first book a better book than it would have been if, I, if it had been published the way I did it. Um, I think it would not have been quite as strong. And when she offered ideas that I felt were too um, in conflict with the integrity of the project, I was able to explain to her why, and she agreed. So it's, you know, ideally it's a conversation between the artist and the editor where they're helping you improve your story so that you're really communicating your ideas clearly. Um, because sometimes we're too close to the project to know what our audience is seeing because we see things that the audience doesn't see. And it takes an objective viewer to help um, make the story better. And if you feel your editor is not making your story better then you probably have the wrong editor. It's a great point. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I wanna make sure since we are coming to the end of our, our time we do have a question from a member of the audience um, who is an illustration um, student at RISD. And so I want to take, throw this to any of you who are interested, but they said, I wonder if there's some advice regarding jobs or directions for college students after graduation. Yeah, easy one to end on tonight, but <laughs> there's so many amazing examples you all have set. So any, any words of wisdom for um, that question? Well, I think that's a whole entire semester for Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> Wrap that up in two minutes. Yeah, I mean, we teach that in an entire semester and actually over a period of two plus years at PAFA, you know, it's, we touch on it in every single class. I think the main, if there's one thing I would say, like a single idea, it's that um, the, the direction you take needs to follow the work that you want to be doing. And not be bound by what you imagine the rules are around that thing. So the old pathways to making a living in illustration were like, bring your portfolio around to art directors and get work in magazines. Not that people don't work in magazines, they do. But it's a very small, as you saw in that you know, mind map, it's just one little branch of what's possible. And I think that Visual artists who want to make a living as visual artists need to think extremely creatively and really, you know, think all like, and, and be bold, you know, try stuff that isn't kind of 
on that palette of like typical answers because as typical answers, everybody does those things and you're not gonna stand out as easily as if you do something really different. Um, you know, I love that image of Chenlin's mural that's on the ground, <laughs> you know, like do like start doing chalk art or something, you know, do something that's gonna be seen and start conversations um, that's based in what you want to be doing. Like if you care about community-based art, then do that. If you care about, you know, something that's um, more commercial, you know, sort of in that world, then follow that. But, you know, you have to, it's so hard to, to be a professional artist. You have to um, do stuff that you believe in and just start doing it. J just do it and start those conversations around the work that you're actually doing that's what leads to paid work rather than going out there and trying to get everything kind of pre-approved, which is sort of the, the standard way of doing things. I feel like unless one of our other panelists has something else to share, that's a really wonderful way to kind of end tonight's program of just go, just go do it. Um, Cause we've seen some really exam amazing examples of how you all are, are doing it. And um, I wanna take this moment to just a huge thank you to all of our panelists. And of course our partners tonight um, with the Woodmere Museum and my counterpart Hilde Tal for sharing the screen and these amazing images. And of course, thank all of you for being here with us. It's been so lovely to see so many of your faces on Zoom. Um, I will let our speakers say the last word, but again, thank you all for being here. Thanks, Abby. Thanks. Yep, thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Go see the exhibition in person if you're in the area. Please, Absolutely. it's up through the end of Bill, yeah, sure. it's up through the end of the month, is that right? Uh, the, the exhibition runs through, it, it, it closes the weekend before Labor Day. So, you know, up to the last, weekend in August. Please come. Oh, yes. All right, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Hello. Bye. Hello. Bye. It's good to see everybody. <laughs> you see. too. Thank you. Of course, you're wonderful. <laughs> Have fun on the farm. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye.